the uh, oh, oh yeah. okay was doing the underwater photography and the one thing there is that uh, geez, um, there okay um, the fish don't pose for you and the water is moving so getting pictures is quite a challenge and uh, I'm going to uh, show you some here. Let me go inside this now. Come on, you can do it. <laughs> there we go. Elderberry is my radical fairy name. Some of you may know I'm gay, I'm married to Peter. <laughs> and uh, Radical Fairies is a, a, a service group of the gay community and we're often awarded names. So mine is Elderberry. Okay, now there's some fascinating things here. Uh, this first one on the left is a flamingo sea slug or nudibranch. It's about an inch long. So the idea was, and this is the other, let me say I was trained to take the pictures in camera. The only thing we can do is to crop or to change uh, contrast or light a little bit. So that nudibranch there here on the left, that's the orange one. Uh, is all an inch or less long. And that's a very fine blue coral that it's on. Uh, this image here on the right is, well, let me put it this way. I entered it in a competition and when they were evaluating it, I couldn't say anything. The judges said, oh, that looks like a swirled Facebook thing. And they didn't give it much consideration. And actually, that is the mantle of a giant clam taken at about 80 feet underwater. Uh, that clam was probably uh, two feet long, and a really giant guy, taken straight down. And in the middle there, you see the, uh, the blowhole of the clam. Yeah. And these little guys, <laughs> the nudibranch here, uh, if you can see it yeah okay oops yeah i'm gonna go right here right, right there there we go on the left here we'll see the two of them and i actually have the good fortune of being able to catch this and what story do you see there what do you think's happening anybody we got the one laying there kind of passively and the other one's up on standing up on his backside well, mating. Yep. Yeah, that's what yeah. I yeah, I was so lucky to get that. He was just, I guess he was a he. I don't know if they're, but how they work quite. But he, he was getting ready to jump. And then uh, when he did, now notice these are different colors. So this is not the same pair. So I didn't get these guys together, but I did later find a pair that were mating. Fascinating story. So what the trainer would do, we would, uh, I'd go on week-long diving trips with this fellow. There'd be like, oh, maybe 10 of us on the trip. Each day we'd be given an assignment to do and we'd bring back our best five pictures we had of that day. And then they'd be shown in the evening and torn apart. I mean, we'd be told what was good, but they would be torn apart in the sense of, uh, there's no story there. I don't want another fish portrait or uh, suggestions on how you can improve it the next day. So that kept us constantly stretching ourselves. And that was really, really very helpful. Uh, so that was one where I got the story. Let's see. I think that's, oh, there's a, on the right hand side here, we have the uh, a giant anemone. And this was on the edge of a cliff that ran down about 100 feet deep. And the uh, fish here are born in these anemone, if you've all seen Nemo, and the anemone give off a very uh, what, stingy uh, secretion that hurts people and other fish to keep them away, but the clownfish are immune from it. So the story here is of 
a community and a symbiotic relationship. And that was, look at the size of that bowl, it's just beautiful. Wow. Yeah. And in here we have just some other things I'll scroll through. That on the left is the eye of an alligator fish. The fish that looks like an alligator. And there the assignment was to, you know, try and get the eye of a fish uh, with some light in it. And I didn't get a very good light there. But this is as taken in the camera. It's just very fascinating. And some of these others are uh, corals. Or here on the right, that's actually a spider-like creature that walks like a spider, but he looks like a coral or a flower. And uh, yeah, the one on the left is another one that's an animal. It's not a coral and it walks and moves. And eels, let's see, let me find one down here. This one, let's see, yeah, okay. I can just, because of time, I'm gonna skim down to one here, let's see him go by. Those are more animals and coral wow. interacting. There's a, uh, yeah, so, a squid. And finally down here, I've got, uh, I think there's a picture. That's our state fish on the right. Um, and on the left, that's a picture of Peter when he's in a bad mood. No. <laughs> <laughs> that guy on the left is a, a rock fish. And he just, they're really ugly and if they hold still, they kind of look like a rock. That's their, the way they uh, disguise themselves. And here on the right, what do you see there? Mm. <laughs> that's a great white. And wow. I went on a shark, shark dive where they let me down in the water uh, in a steel tank or steel uh, cage, but there was no top on it. And they dropped me down and I'd stand up take the pictures, but if they came close to the cage, I had to duck down again. And uh, wow. I think, that's it. yeah, that was something. Do, 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 do. And I would just want to show you down here the picture of, oh, no, it's not in there. Okay. Ah, why did you do that again? Okay. Uh, well, that's good enough on that one. Um, so we had, uh, uh, in order to do that photography, uh, I had to have a big case that encased the camera itself that what they call dome ports that go over the lenses and then big arms with two strobes. So the whole thing was kind of humongous to handle. And then we had on dive gloves and other things and we had to be able to operate the buttons. And the advantage of the digital was we could see what we got right away, but we only looked at the histogram. That was it, <laughs> because then you could tell whether you'd blown it out or not, and you'd adjust it and retake it. We didn't bother looking at the image. It was just look at the histogram. And so all of that training helped immensely when I came above land to do it. And that led to my uh, landscape work where I went with the, the team. Again, the National Geographic selected four, uh, five of us amateurs to go with them. We went to Iceland. And that resulted in some of the pictures you may have seen at Laura's. But there, again, difficult uh, photography environment. We went in the winter. The sun came up at 11 and set at 2. We went out at 8 o'clock in the morning. So we were out on glaciers taking pictures in the dark without flash. But with the new cameras, you can crank the uh, ISO up to 60,000 or so. And we were focusing on the technique of getting, of stopping water in waterfalls um, and wherever we could. And that was, <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. The wind was blowing so hard in one place, I had to hang onto the rail and it was you know, blowing my camera. And after that particular trip I, event, I found that my tripod had actually been bent, the wind was so strong. <laughs> and walking back, I made the mistake, never do this guys. I had my camera over my shoulder, my tripod over my shoulder with the camera on it. I slipped on an ice bridge, fell on my back, 
and the camera impacted on the ice. And I lost my wide angle lens. <laughs> and this was in the first few days of the trip. <laughs> Jeez. I'll never do that one again. I mean, that was a $700 lens. You know, I was like, ting. <laughs> so the uh, Iceland picture that some of you may have seen at Laura's, a big long landscape, that was, I had to do that with panoramic using a Canon 6D, which I really like. My underwater was done with the Canon 5D. Um, and the 6D includes video and some other things. And it's a, it's a good camera. I know they're higher end ones, but it works for me. So that's, I think I've probably used my time there. Uh, and so if you want to see more of my work, you can go to elderberryimages.org. There's there, and I'm constantly adding to it now that I got it started because of the Arts of Point Richmond. <laughs> I realized people were asking me, oh, what's your website? I'd like to see your work. So I really appreciate all that you are doing to lift us amateurs up and, and have us get our work out there and being able to see it and share it. So I look forward to your questions and I really appreciate all the opportunities I've had to share my work here with Arts of Point Richmond. Okay, you can unmute yourselves. <laughs> all right. Can we see uh, one of the uh, lands a couple of landscape photos? Yeah, let's, um, yes, we can. Let me go back to uh, the, Right, let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, my website is refreshing itself. So let's see. Um, now let's see. Um, right. Let's see. Well, well, right. you know, Doug, as I say, I'm glad to see some additional images that I've never seen before. On, on. Uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, they're great. Yeah, it was great, Doug. Thank you very much. It felt like I learned a lot. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, very interesting. I'll, I'll bring up. Yeah, thank you. I mean, your experience doing these things adds a lot for me. Yeah. True. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Now I got it. It's trying to come up with it. It's not the fastest internet. Are there any, any other questions while this thing is getting itself back up? Um, let me see. Come on. You see a, a lot of uh, photography now that has the. Uh, <laughs> stopped or slowed down or blurred that's becoming quite popular which doing that in the dark was just incredible <laughs> that is not responding let's try one more okay let's see okay So do you always use a camera or have you, or do you ever take photos with um, an iPhone? Uh, I, I have used um, my phone on occasion. Uh, it's often when I don't have the larger camera with me. I much prefer to use the, uh, the Canon because the, while the, the phones do generate some amazing photography, um, <laughs> I'm just so conditioned and like the control that you get with a single lens reflex. I've used only the mirrored type. Now they have the non-mirrored and I haven't tried one of those. But the ability to uh, control uh, the aperture and the speed and the ISO, and then you get uh, depth of field and things you can do that you just can't do with the phone, no matter what they say. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And my my this machine is just spinning on loading, so it's probably something with the internet. So, um, if I'm able to get it going after Peter's, and if we have a few moments, I can show you some more landscapes. But you can get them 
Um, if you go to my website and look at the uh, award winners, there's um, a number of landscapes there. And at the uh, Point Richmond Post Office, uh, there's a beautiful one in, that we took in Norway right near the uh, North Pole. <laughs> and it just, it, I find it stunning in myself. Uh -huh. It shows the, uh, uh, the fishing houses and the water and the mountains all in one. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. I'll definitely go by the post office windows to see. Yeah, yeah. This <laughs> yeah. I'll work on getting getting this to come up while Peter's talking. So if you have a moment at okay. the end, I can show you those. So. Okay. I am unmuted. Right. Okay. Well, um, let's see. I'm going to show you some early Carlton work. I'm going to move. I have a camera on. Uh, I mean, I have my computer on a, an office chair, so I'm going to ro roll the camera around to where I'm going to sit next to the work. Are you in our studio, Peter? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. So this is uh, maybe around 1940, the year I was born. Um, all right. So. Uh, I, now I've got to change from, how do I, I want to, uh, oh dear, now what do I do? Mm. It was good, Peter, we could see it. Well, but now it's just a zoom on the screen. What have I done? Oh dear, okay. <laughs> oh no. Hey, we still see you, I guess you don't see us. So you can do a, a control tab. Or right, join a meeting, I guess it's gonna join it. No, you're already in the meeting. Peter, uh, we can hear well, you. I don't see anything except the white screen and the word Zoom. Yeah, if you do a control tab or command tab. Command. Show, yeah, yeah, your uh, Zoom okay. screen. <laughs> Uh, please watch the something resting on the speaker or the microphone. All right, so here we go. All right now, I want okay, so how do I? All right, so do I click on my own image here to get the full one? God, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you can see what we're seeing. So if you <laughs> You okay? You got it? Well, no, I don't see the image. I mean, I, I, I don't see, all right, I just see a small screen of me and you, okay. you, you're filling the screen. Yeah, there you go. That's all you need. If, if you can just see okay. you and you're seeing what, right. what we're seeing. That's perfect. Yeah, there you go. Okay. All right. So my mother was a, a watercolor painter. And she was a single parent after uh, age my age two, so I grew up with her in the house or the apartment in New York, and watched her painting. And when we traveled, uh, she painted, and uh, we stayed. In, when I was six, we stayed down in Nassau, in the Bahamas, in a hotel, and she would paint local people and scenery and then it would be put on the walls of the halls of the hotel 
And when she sold the painting, then that went towards our rent for the hotel. So this is one of her early in my life paintings. This is a picture of one of our neighbors when we went to, to uh, Bermuda when I was nine. Oh, nice. I think quite dignified. Yes. I like I like it very much. It's a favorite of mine. And um some of the looseness of the brush strokes down here for the collar I like. Uh and then the, the strength in the face. And one of the things that my mother expressed about um as we got into the 1950s and I was in my early teens uh, she, and Mark Rothko and Franz Klein were doing their abstractions, she began to feel uneasy about her style and um, wanted to try to do more spontaneous things. And she would do a, maybe something half the size of this painting. And then she would find that in the corner of, of the, the thing she was doing, there was a way the paint had behaved that she really liked, but it was so small that she couldn't make it into a real painting. And she expressed frustration. And in a way that has influenced me because what, we can do now is we can have a very high resolution picture taken of of an area. And so in contrast to what Doug was saying about composing his thing in the camera, I would I can zero in on a small area of what I paint, uh, which is a little like watercolor. Um, and uh, and choose it and crop it the way I want it and can have it greatly enlarged. So in the post office window, there's, there's something that is about enlarged about uh, let's say five times larger than the original. Um, but before I show you anything of my work, I will show you an artist of that era who uh, actually died only a few years ago in his 80s. And you may know the name, uh, Paul Jenkins, who was famous for his work with flowing paint across a tilted or a suspended canvas. And this is uh, a painting by Jenkins that I bought in uh, Mill Valley a few years ago. It's an original. And um, so here we're still with watercolor. Um, and some of the areas he would let dry and then he would um, add color to other areas that were still wet. And um, mother loved his work and I did too. And um, was then for the next about 40 years, I didn't do any artwork. I just had my mother's work in my mind and the things that I liked. And then uh, 
I started doing, uh, getting interested in painting on silk when I saw some of the beautiful bright colors, the, the dyes that they used on white silk absolutely glowed, and I started with that. I don't have any of that work still with me. Um, Here is a piece that is in the window at the post office. And um, so what I do is I paint on Paint on aluminum with the dyes that are used to reproduce photography on aluminum um, sheets. So I start with something like this. The back is aluminum, front has a cover to protect it, and then it has a coating of. Uh, polyester, the same kind of uh, chemical composition as polyester fabric on which they can print designs. But what I do is I take the, the liquid dyes that are put into the, or the, they call them inks, um, they are put into a printer so when you have a photograph that you want reproduced on a metal sheet, um, you take it and then they take a high resolution or you bring your photograph in, in a digital form. And then they, they print it with dye onto paper, which looks a little dull. And then they lay that onto facing the polyester coating on the aluminum sheet and they raise the temperature for about a minute to a minute and a half to about 350 degrees. And the dye does what is called sublime. It becomes, it goes from the dry state on the paper that it was printed in in the printer from your photograph. It becomes a gas and it transfers to the paper. Uh, I'm sorry, to the, the, the polyester coating on the aluminum. So what I've done is I've cut out the machine and I go directly from the dye bottles that are in, in the, the printer machine. And I find a way to get, make them stick or make them thick enough to dry onto the aluminum sheet. So, in this case, then the photograph was taken of the original, and then it went through that photographic process and it's printed with the same kind of dyes back on a, into an enlarged sheet of aluminum if I want the image to be larger. So this is looks exactly like the original and it's printed with the same dyes on the same kind of surface. So in a, way, I, in a way, I don't know whether to call it a, 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 uh, a print or not. It's, it's so exactly similar to the original. Um, but that gives you a little idea of how my work comes about, how I do it. And my secret ingredient comes from a children's class in art where they used shaving cream. And they mixed it with dyes. And uh, then the kids could use that to kind of spread it around. And this, this kind of dye is really quite harmless. Uh, it can, of course, get under your fingernails, but um, uh, kids can use it. So... Um, and you probably, you may have seen 
things where these dyes are used in crayons, a special kind of crayon, and you draw on paper and then you iron it onto the child's shirt. It's the same kind of dye. So this was probably about a quarter this size in the original, this one. And I had it originally printed much larger with about a third again as much of the original in the composition. It was bigger, took in more than this, and then I cropped it. So what I get to do is resize and crop and zero in on things like my mother would have said, oh, now that's yummy right there. That's, I, want, I want to keep that. <laughs> So that's that's part of the reason why I love love this medium. Another reason practically is that uh, if it doesn't look interesting to me after I've dried it, after I dry it out, um, I can wash it off and almost almost none of the dye is taken on the surface and I can start over. When I want to set the dye, then I use a heat gun like a super hair dryer on the back and that's uh that's how i do introduce the heat that that uh, when you have a photograph printed transfers it from the print on the paper with the dye to the aluminum sheet okay so now i think i want to say a little bit about kind of why what art is for me right now um i mean i have i've i swing from kind of some unease about spending the amount of money that doing this cost and um it would have been things that I could have done, my mother could not have done, and uh, I wouldn't have had the money to do to try. So I feel very lucky to be able to do this now. And then I kind of ask philosophical questions about the, the meaning of this in the world and uh, what's happening in the world and where is it in the scheme of things. And I have a very philosophical side that is uh, complementary to this, and it's kind of hard to bring the two together. Um, so originally, there was a period after the painting on silk, I got interested in fiber, in dyed nylon instead of polyester. It was a different class of dyes that are you know, used on nylon. And um, I used batting that I had dyed, and I combed it together, and I made it into three dimen into three dimensional pieces that were put into a box frame. And um, then suddenly I saw that the box frame that I was framing my fiber pieces in, I started to see it as a like because it had such depth, it was three to four inches deep. It wasn't like a glass placed right over a painting. It had this extra space in there. And I started to see this as a head that was facing me with a vertical and a horizontal and a composition. And I remembered my mother holding up a paintbrush to, to look at a scene in front of her that she was painting which she wanted to get the vertical and how important that was. And um, so I started to look at the whole meaning of how we use space in language to describe the self. And suddenly uh, the artwork that I was doing in the box frames, I completely abandoned that. And for the last, for the next about 30 years, I spent looking at philosophy and language and how to model the self using space. And then about 10 years ago, I resumed uh, on and off um, artwork. 
So now here I am doing this and uh, looking for ways to bring the ideas about space and words and linguistics and philosophy and how to bring that together with the uh, with the art. It's something that I feel like I'd like to see that integration before I can't do it anymore. And um, so I have fantasies of doing things there that are almost more like philosophical studies. <laughs> that are comments on, on the vertical and the horizontal and to play with that, um, but to do it with, uh, with paint or a dye and shaving cream or some other thickener on this surface, but it would, it would be part of a, uh, a scene, uh, a series that I would call, this is not a painting, number one. <laughs> This is not a painting, number two. <laughs> this is not a painting, number three. And um, so my fantasy is of, of doing, you know, those those things that you can stick a, on the wall uh, in your shower so that you can grab onto them. I would use that to grab onto the back of my aluminum. And I would have one in he each hand and I would press them together and use them as the squeegee to apply the dye to each of them. And then when I was satisfied with both of them, they would become a diptych and I would heat, I would heat them both. And that would be, that would be kind of the form that I would use. So that's where I'm going to conclude, except I'm going to show you one more image. Um, and um, just let you think a little bit about what you think this, what, what you see in this one. I wanted so much to have this in the post office window, but I couldn't find it. And then I found it yesterday. <laughs> okay. So anybody who wants to comment and, uh, and then we can open it up to questions. It's a very nice image. Yeah, you have quite a process, Peter. Very, um, and I, 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 I can't imagine pulling all those different creative and exploration of the world and the universe and philosophy together to try and put that in an art piece that you could be satisfied with. Yeah. <laughs> what a challenge. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but I like this very much, this last image. I'm sorry it didn't get put in the window. Well, um, uh, Peter, uh, Peter, do you have the... Uh... I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Uh, do you have another piece like the Small Ignorant Armies or the uh, the one that I, I do. call the, the Disney Meadow to show them? Because it's so different from okay, yes. the ones they've seen so far. Okay. What are you okay. able to do it blows me away. Uh, I think I have not... here down in this. <laughs> the, uh, I've never watched him do it. I just see him, he brings the pieces home and they put them on a table and he walks around it and around it and it, it'll sit there maybe for a day or two. And then he, he takes uh, like pieces of uh, uh, cardboard and kind of blocks off parts and looks at those parts and moves those around. And then he finds what he wants. And it's just oh, no. so serendipitous compared to what I do with the camera. Now, the... I, I would just say that the accidental quality, um, I call them happy, st happy stage accidents, uh, is important to me. I like not seeing the hand of the artist or myself in the work. I like 
to be mystified by how how the image is made. Um, so this is kind of the antithesis of the well-practiced images of horses in uh, fields in China with cherry blossoms that uh, you feel the hand of the artist is very skilled, but to me, it, it is not interesting. I want the surprise. Um, this one, let's see now. It's hard to see. Well, okay. Doug, can you tell me whether that's kind of in yeah? The... There, there's a uh, uh, there's a glare in the middle. I think it's a reflection from your uh, monitor or something. Well, uh, again, uh, yeah, it is. But I don't know what you can do about that. So I and, up, yeah, no, I, I came up with a solution for it. Let's see if I can if it works. Yeah, but this is so amazing. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's good, Peter. Yeah, there you go. That's good. Yeah, how he got the depth of field there and the light and the, it's... <laughs> I don't know, it, it is a dark image and I don't know whether it, it comes across there. I can't really see it on no, my screen good. at this angle. But it does, uh, this is, so like many of my things are surprises to me and they're not re repeatable. I don't, I'm not disciplined enough to take down the, the methods very much of how I did something. So the treasures are these kind of unique things that one doesn't look much like another in, in technique. And the things sometimes that I had reproduced or framed a few years ago don't stand up, they don't hold my interest now. But this one is, four times the size in the in the post office window and i i really like it um and i feel it's quite mysterious how it's done and uh, i think i've only told one person how i did it me <laughs> <laughs> most of the time i give I give give away how how something is done but sometimes i'm a little reluctant <laughs> okay Peter, do, do you, um, can you turn the, is, do you still have that very colorful, um, large piece? Yeah, I do. Oh, that's, yeah, that's the one I was thinking of too. Yeah. One of the things that it's interesting to me to have um, Doug and Peter talking at the same time is I see their, their different approach, the work is reflecting one another from entirely different persp perspectives mm -hmm. and um, in to entirely different approaches. And what we're not seeing, and, and it's interesting to me as Peter's friend, is um, it, we don't see his his wild color ones. So we'll have to lobby Peter to give another talk on his wild color ones. And this one that he's showing is a little bit more of the color. And I, I find his, Peter, your capacity to work with the very powerful colors and range and to really explore the ideas of color, juxtapose the ideas of darks and lights that are reflected through the blacks and whites and the browns. And um, in a short period of time, I mean, as you, everybody on the Zoom can hear, Peter's reflections and thoughts about the painting are very rich. And so um, in the time we, in the time of observing these paintings, we don't, we're, we're not seeing the colors, but Peter has as many works in color as he has in blacks and whites and darks and lights. Yeah, the, the color, the color ones are a real risk. There's, I mean, there's partly because the dyes, when they're in the unheated state, are not their final color. They're off from it. They're often much duller. You don't know what it's really going to look like when it's done. So, um, and you can't you can't do much to adjust the color, although you can do some when the photographer takes it. Um, but uh, so it's it's a real gamble to throw a lot of color in, and um, I, I right now I'm no longer interested in sales. 
I'm more interested in being transparent about what the process is, what it means to me, what I th think art is, or all that. And so I will look at something. And um, my mother was a very poor saleswoman. And she would call attention to all the things that were wrong with her paintings before she would sell some one to somebody because she wanted to be sure that they really liked it. <laughs> and my form of that now is that I really want to be real about where I, you know, like one is in a friendly group of people who critique each other's writing or, or uh, photography. Um, uh, you know, so I could begin to tell you what I don't like about this. <laughs> Don't do that. But there you are. <laughs> I definitely encourage anybody who's wants to catch up with Peter um, to get yourself invited to see some of his in his studio the the color dynamics as well as these blacks and whites. And okay, thank you, Alan. Exploration. <laughs> okay. And Peter, your uh, exploration of these colors and thoughts about the way the colors play uh, is really what it is to me what it is being an artist. Peter, I think um, you have on a stand there in the studio, the one that I call the Disney Meadow. Uh, it has such a difference. Uh, and you use some different techniques that created what looked like twigs and branches of trees in a meadow. I don't know if that's readily yeah, I, available. I, I, think, I think it's here, but um, okay. to check, check with Irene. How are we on time, Irene? Please let me know. Yeah, well, you have a few more minutes. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and put it on this hand. I I put our uh, respective um, website URLs in the chat if you want to get those. And I think chats are available after Zoom too, if you want. But you can uh, copy those if you want. Thank yeah. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, and my my little I've got a little computer here, and my uh, I would have to reboot it to get it. <laughs> get the browser to work for some reason so i just but you'll find my images on my website yeah this one oh i love this one mm. and it's just it's totally different like the iron armies was totally different um yeah, my little tool for look at that blocking the There's reflection the branches there that look at those <laughs> yeah that's that's it, Peter. Yeah. This is square, so this is. Yeah. And I have to find the little thing that blocks the reflection, but I don't know where it is right now. That's okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you could uh, move your camera up a little so they can get the whole picture. Okay. I found the. I found my black. Oh, I like that. Yeah. But look, look at the, the look like twigs and branches in blue yeah. and brown, different colors. And the red, oh, and just to try and imagine how he did that by spreading colors with shaving cream. I don't have a clue. <laughs> it's not always shaving cream. There are other thickeners. But, oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, uh, did you say move the camera up a little? Well, yeah, you got something blocking it now. So whatever you're doing. Yeah. I, yeah. I, we can't see the top of the painting. You're blocking the camera. Yeah, you're blocking it with something, yeah. Ooh, that's strange. Yeah, there it is. Earlier good. it seemed to be working, but. Uh, there, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. You're getting close. Oh, yeah, there. There. Yeah, almost. Can I leave it there? Well, this uh, that is a technique, technique that uh, the, the branching stuff is. Fairly common, I think, in, uh, I think my mother saw it in a magazine called American Artist when I was in my teens. It's a, you, you put the paint on glass and then you press the paper against, and, uh, and then when you pull the paper up, it's thick enough so that it pulls 
it resists pulling the paper away and forms these little rivulets. What I really, uh, there's one in which I use different layers of those in different positions and, um, and I, ha I have ways that I would like to work with that that kind of enrich and complicate the, the, uh, the technique a little bit because to me it looks like something that I learned about in the 50s. <laughs> Uh, uh, notice the I see a moose on the right. He's standing on a red uh, rock there. I do, I do too. And off to yeah. the left in the meadow is a little brown thing. It might be a squirrel or something. And just the more I look at it, I can imagine things, which is the beauty of abstract art. Well, I will finish with a story that I have a large painting by a Marin artist, about five feet by five feet, and. Uh, in the process of moving from my house to the apartment where we live together now, the the wire came off <laughs> the painting and uh, Doug rehung it, but he rehung it upside down, <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't notice for three days. <laughs> Um, and when I turned it right side up, he said, well, well, now where is the wise man in the cave that I used to see? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was very painful. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> okay, well, this well, has been a pleasure, folks. Thank you. Isn't that what art is supposed to be? Isn't it supposed to be exciting? Yeah. Isn't yeah. it supposed to be exciting? You know, excite us, you know, our emotions. <laughs> That's marvelous. <laughs> so, Peter, you told me you were also involved in writing a book and publishing it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's about the uh, the linguistic side that uh, that I was philosophy that I was referring to earlier. I was. It became an immediate project. This, when I was looking at those box frames and began to see that the the shadow that it cast on the wall was the Jungian shadow. The light in the gallery or in the room shows you what the person puts out, and uh, the covering on the on the board that was at the back of the frame was the front that we put up or the persona, the, the theatrical mask. Um, and then what was in the box frame was what one was expressing or what was what one was photographing or whatever the artwork was. It was your your transmission of your gift of the way you saw the world. And then the front of the box frame, the, the plexiglass in front was our boundary issues where we say, no, this side is my my affair, and you can't come any closer. But you can see through this boundary. You can look across the fence if it's transparent, or you can look through it. So, and then the wall became the image representing some nesting system that we are in, like a family system or a, a citizenship or. A, being human, or, and then the space outside the room th through the wall became our, our familiar everyday word or phrase for that is things that are beyond space and time. So there was our language using space to talk about things that are not spatial. And we have to name it somehow, so we say it's beyond space and time. So I became absolutely fascinated with how many different ways we use space to describe thinking and abstract things that we don't, we can't see. So similarity it can be close or it can be very distant. Um, um, a mind that you can't see, but it can be broad or it can be narrow, uh, and so on and so on. It's just, it's, I discovered this 
and I didn't know what what it was. What was I seeing? I didn't have enough philosophy or linguistics to understand why this all fell into place. Well, it's because we we base so much of our linguistic understanding of ourselves on bodily space. It's just a common denominator. I felt like I had discovered a philosophical elixir. And what was it? And it, then somebody said to me, well, have you looked at Metaphors We Live By by George Lakoff? He's right there in Berkeley. You can go listen to his lectures. So for two years, I was listening. I was looking at my box frames. I had abandoned the fiber work and was trying to understand why was this image so powerful? And it's because it tunes into all the things that we do with the horizontal axis, the vertical axis, and the front back axis. So finally, I'll just come. I'll just finish with my little song. Uh, um, uh, but I won't try to sing it, I'll just recite it. <laughs> but it's uh, the two-way street between us strands. Now notice the spatial words in each of these lines, there are eight lines. The two-way street between us friends. The boundary, that's my warning sign. The gift for you I put out here. The front I show that's looking fine. Inside I sense and think and feel. In back, the storehouse of my mind, the living systems we are in, unfolding through all space and time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> I, put, I put in the chat the uh, title of the book is being published on Amazon as a Kindle because of time. We'll have print copies soon. And I also put uh, my book that I wrote for my doctoral dissertation this year. So Peter and I both published a book this year. <laughs> I'm, I'm turning 81 next week and Peter turns 83 the first week of May. So the 80s are Happy birthday. birthday. <laughs> okay. yes. You're outdone by our hostess. Yes. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you so much. We've run over our time and, and, uh, um, I, you know, this has been fascinating. Any, any last minute uh, comments from anyone? Yes. Yes. I have one. I, any, any, um, any progress on reconciling the, that philosophical conundrum? Well, uh, I feel like th that play between the two surfaces will force me or make it very likely that I will turn something at an angle that is not flat on the wall. Oh. It, will, it won't be a painting. It'll be something more sculptural, a little more than a collage. It'll be a, a cardboard box that you couldn't quite flatten to put into the uh, recycling. <laughs> that's life <laughs> I love it I love it that's great oh, love it, Peter. Oh, great thank you everybody thank you well this has been thank you. really fun thank you and I, I have to apologize I was so fascinated with starting everything that I forgot to to uh, record but it, I did finally, uh, while Doug was talking, record it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs>